read like a little intro because it's for a project about your work. Josh DiVincenzo is an assistant director for education and training and adjunct lecturer at the National Center for Disaster Preparedness, Columbia University. His focus is developing learning experiences associated with FEMA training projects that navigate housing and economic recovery. He hopes to create accessible and quality educational programming that benefits the common good at scale. He holds a master's degree at education policy, organization, and leadership from the University of Illinois at Urbana campaign and is currently a doctoral, a doctoral student of adult learning and leadership at Teachers College Columbia University. Okay, thanks so much. Um, we'll read our first question. Um, so we want to start off by asking like which teacher like influenced your life the most and what do you love most about teaching? Okay, uh, really, really tough question, but thanks for the opportunity to kind of discuss this. Um, teacher that influenced me the most is a very non-scientific answer, but I think, uh, especially in high school, it was very much uh, the music teachers, the conductors, uh, choir directors, and things like that, uh, mainly because it it has influenced um, how I approach teaching, because, you know, with music and and kind of the arts, there's a lot of, you know, not getting it right on the first try. And actually in research, there's a lot of the same kind of process of messing up a lot until you get it cor uh, correct and you uh, diminish, the, uh, diminish the margin of error. So it's a lot of repetitive work, but the more kind of disciplined and the more that you practice, the more you can kind of fine tune either as a musician, but then even as like a researcher, educator. Um, I just thought the level of creativity that teachers approached um, kind of music education was a level of creativity that we don't necessarily all, all the time see in the sciences. And uh, I've tried to transfer that as much as possible into my own teaching and kind of make things engaging uh, and look at different ways of, of one, some of these repetitive tasks, but making them, making sure students are aware of, you know, at the end, it's all going to come together. Uh, even if we're out of tune right now, eventually we'll kind of all be on the same page. Great. Thank you so much. And can you talk a little bit more about your background and why you became interested in your work? Yeah, so I took a kind of uh, not a direct path into the climate change space. I think that's becoming more frequent um, nowadays where no matter kind of what major you go down or discipline, uh, there's ways to integrate into the climate change system and, and make a lot of impact. So for me, I started this work from more the business context. So it was really important for me to understand how kind of industries work, uh, how trade works around the world. Uh, and when I was first getting interested in kind of climate change and uh, the impacts of climate change, it was more from this idea of globalization that, you know, we're trading around the world, countries are trading things all the time. Um, and then I didn't realize uh, to the extent back then how much planetary impact that actually had. And I think there was no avoiding it at that point. All the actions that we were making from like an economic standpoint or a business standpoint was going to have some type of impact on the environment. And I think now it's become much more uh, kind of common to have those conversations. So it's uh, it's been nice to see that. But uh, I then studied policy because I, so I guess I wanted to start, start first with how do businesses work? Uh, the second was more, how does the law work? How do policies in the United States govern our decisions as um, communities and more on the collective side? And then my my doctorate was looking more at how do people actually think about it? So looking at the psychology of climate change. So as many perspectives as you can gather is really helpful in this, in this space. And I think through my background, uh, that's uh, kind of led me down this journey. And the reason I became interested is because I wanted to impact the solution or I wanted to contribute to the solution because uh, there's a lot of places where you kind of just are watching this happen and there's not much that you can really do about it because you're staying within your lane and that's fine and well. For me, it was uh, kind of, you know, what can I do with the training that I have, the expertise that I have to contribute something to the solution? Thank you so much. Um, and then how do you have civil conversations about climate change? It's very difficult. It takes a lot of patience, um, but it's it's definitely a skill you want to practice. You know, I think it's especially uh, I think people are coming around to the science, coming around to it being less of a, a debate. Uh, I think we've all kind of uh, seen the impacts firsthand. I think every week you read about a hurricane, a fire, a snowstorms coming to New York. You know, there's all kinds of climate impacts that are very tangible now. Uh, and I think that's brought a lot of people that historically have not necessarily been on board or in favor or on one, one way or the other uh, to the conversation. So right now is actually the best time to start having these conversations. Um, I think in terms of keeping it civil, uh, you know, you can't, it's going to be tough to monitor everybody's emotions. They're going to people that, and from my experience, even looking at it from the psychological standpoint, a lot of it's fear. 
and uh, it's kind of the fear of on the unknown, the fear that we don't have enough time, and it comes out in how people present their arguments. But I think if we can level set and just bring it into problem solving with those individuals or with those stakeholders, uh, those conversations tend to be more civil. Um, I think it's okay to have the emotional side to these conversations because people really do care about it. Um, but I think if you can find ways to bring it into like an agenda in terms of, uh, these are the things we're trying to work on, um, and pick people's brains. Um, the last thing on the civil conversations piece, I would say is just, it has to be a respectful conversation. I think that's been one thing I've learned is, you know, if you go at it too confrontationally with someone who you've never had a conversation around climate change with before, uh, that shuts them down and then they just don't want to engage anymore. The idea is it's going to be multiple conversations. You, it's very rare. You'll be able to kind of level set with somebody on the one try but if they're open to continuing to talk to you about it uh then i think that's a successful and civil conversation around climate change um yeah so also another question is like what has been the most interesting part of your work and career so far yeah our work's been absolutely busy lately uh just because there's so much going on in the world too so um I think uh, initially we were very much focused on the social impact. So a lot of my expertise is on what happens to businesses, economies after a disaster event happens, uh, oftentimes attributed to the climate change, fo focusing on climatological disasters. Uh, so one thing that's been really unique or fulfilling about my career so far is that we've actually been really hands-on with the communities. So it's nothing that's like super theoretical where we're only kind of sitting in like that stereotypical like Columbia office and just thinking about what would play out. We're actually out in the field, uh, traveling all over the all, all over the place really to kind of engage and hear what people's experiences have been, the, the uh, disaster kind of survivors from fires and all these different events. And they're describing, well, you know, what are their needs? And it brings a really personal, personal element to it that I think has been really fulfilling. The work has led, I guess, on the interesting side to all types of projects. So we got heavily involved with some of the pandemic planning and preparedness. And one thing that we're working on right now is, you know, how do we better prepare the United States for any type of pandemic like event in the future uh we've gotten involved with uh, a really interesting project looking at what we know from the united states around the trauma that happens after children experience disaster events and now we're helping out on a really interesting project with ukraine and poland uh to address uh the the children that are going through traumatic experiences right now due to the war uh and it's been a really nice kind of international knowledge share on that that i never thought uh, my career was going to head in that direction, but that's been really fulfilling for me, at least in the last year, to kind of be able to help out and um, and think through some solutions for them. Yeah, I know you've mentioned like um, a lot about your work overall, but can you tell us like more about um, your work regarding disaster preparedness, like something specific or anything in general? Yeah, I mean, disaster preparedness is such an interesting uh, concept to work on with communities because no one wants to think about a disaster happening to them, unfortunately. Like, no one wants to kind of like have to plan ahead uh, of, you know, if you have a hurricane happen, what are what's going to be some of the expenses? Are you going to be able to recover? Does your family have to relocate? Is what happens if a home gets destroyed? Um, so, with the disaster preparedness uh, realm, we try to really engage these communities before the disaster happens because the work multiplies by 100 if it's some if we're going in right after in the recovery phase. Uh, so the preparedness part is these things that uh, when it's really nice outside, we don't have a lot of things that are that we're worrying about uh, is when we try to actually go and engage with these communities. But uh, what's been really difficult lately with all the clim climatological disasters is um, the frequencies really unreal to kind of keep track of. So it could be something's happening on the West Coast, a week later, something's happening on the East Coast. And every community in the United States is so different from one another. So it's what, what might be prioritized in like a small kind of rural town in Kentucky that was just damaged is going to be very different than like if we have to uh, prepare, let's say, Manhattan in New York City. And um, so that's been a really tough part on the preparedness side because it's not kind of a one size fits all approach. Um, but for us as researchers, too, it, it helps us out because we need to really learn the country, we need to learn all the communities, uh, we need to learn the language, going back to the civil conversations piece, we need to know what's actually going to be important to them. Um, and I don't really think we have to really sell preparedness anymore, because people have just seen how impactful this has been. Um, but I would say, although we do focus on preparedness, so much of what we're doing now is just recovery, because these events are happening so, so frequently. Yeah, that was kind of the, our next question is like, what kind of work exactly goes into disaster recovery? 
it's it's tough because you are balancing social dimensions so like wanting to make sure that you're inclusive uh and thinking about equity uh in what goes into recovery you're balancing the political uh so you uh, every every town you kind of have to go into or city you have to go into understand the political landscape. Um, they all have different funding structures. Um, and then there's, of course, the economic where it's you want them to truly recover. One of the things that has been challenging us on disaster recovery since the pandemic has been interesting because uh, everyone's looking at what did we define a recovered community as and it was that really the normalcy that was equitable for everybody and that's kind of got everyone scratching their heads because disaster recovery is one of these things that uh, the media and and uh, a lot of the news outlets will cover it right in the instance and like maybe a week after like you'll follow that that storm or what's happening but the actual recovery process takes like five ten years or more uh, so these are one of these things where it's tough to get the long-term investment into disaster recovery um, and there's just unfortunately and just the really honest answer to this is uh there's a lot of things that often will slip through the cracks. So, so it's it's really tough to do a perfect disaster recovery. Uh, sometimes these communities are uh, completely unable to fully recover. And then uh, even if they do, if there was already pre-existing like inequalities or issues in that community or that city uh, after a disaster, those are still going to be there if not multiplied. So what we're finding is like, yeah, we're sorting out the climate issues, but then when we have like a new person a new city or new group that we're working with on preparedness or recovery we also feel we also are encountering having to sort out historical underlying issues uh in that community so disaster recovery is also just like a very much a social issue as well um so it's uh it's a tough one uh but a lot of work goes into it this is where the science community and the uh, social science community really comes together well because we're looking at all the different dimensions of it um but the last layer of complexity with it is the fact that they might have another disaster and that's kind of our biggest fear is like you know we get to a recovery point five years out and in that six year they have another hurricane or another major storm and you kind of have to rebuild that all over again uh and i think that's getting really frustrating and aggravating for a lot of the communities in the in in the country and then of course around the world too uh because that's a whole different conversation but that's a uh, disaster recovery in a nutshell but i i would say like not to end it on like a uh a uh, pessimistic note on the optimistic note there's a lot of really good things that happen in disaster recovery there's new programs that get rolled out at that local level that help to kind of respond to some of the gaps that i was talking about that might be more historical uh it brings communities together in, in a really strong way i think um of course new york is a great testament after superstorm stan sandy a lot of uh community members came together the nonprofits working with the private sector the private sector working with the public sector uh so there's a lot behind the scenes that uh oftentimes doesn't get talked about in disaster recovery that strengthens the community as much of as much as this is a very complex process thank you so much great thank well you. we really appreciate your time and sorry about the technical difficulties at the beginning <laughs> Yeah, no problem, no problem. about all of your work. Yeah. It sounds amazing. And we're so thankful for everything that you do. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. And good luck with the project. If there's anything else I could do, definitely uh, feel free to reach out. Thank you all so right, much. Guys, thank you. Have a great Thanks. rest of the day. Bye. You, you too.